Well, hello, everybody. So we're going to go over some spine coating and coating the facet injections. If you happen to receive something that said we're doing infections today, I don't know anything about spinal infections. So we are dealing with injections. So starting off, of course, with the anatomy, we can't do anything else without knowing what we're talking about here. So the spine can be very difficult. Um, it can be confusing because like in the cervical vertebrae, they count the axis and the atlas, you know, way up in the, the stem by the brain. Um, so that could be confusing. Well, is it that part of the brain or is that a different bone, but it's part of the spinal column? So we have the seven vertebrae. They go from C1 to C7 in the cervical. Thoracic, we have 12 vertebrae, so they go from T1 to T12. Lumbar, we have five. They go from L1 to L5. Sacral, we have five, and coccyx, we have four. So actually, when people are born, you know, babies are born and grow through the, up until adolescence, they're actually, the, the sacrum and the coccyx are actually those four and five vertebrae. But after adolescence is when they fuse and they count them as one bone. So it sometimes gets a little bit confusing. So if you see in the uh, picture on the side, you, you can tell those different, you know, the little bumps pointing out, the little protrusions that they have. And you can see the different spaces in between each of those vertebrae. Well, when you get down to the orange and the red, they're all like a lump all together. Well, that's because after adolescence, those bones all fused into one. Those vertebrae became one. So you hear people say, we well, have 33 vertebrae. Well, no, we, you know, those, you have 33 bones. And then they became those vertebrae that fused. So it can get a little bit confusing depending upon what you're talking about. Um, some people may say, well, the sacral is only one. Well, you know, but they're five fused. So there are 33 vertebrae. We have them for support. That's the reason we have all these vertebrae. Um, they actually house the spinal nerves. So in between the vertebrae is like a column that has all the spinal nerves running through there. And then they branch out in between each of the vertebrae, they'll branch out. So they have them, they bear weight, and then we have them to support our weight as well. Uh, the seraph, uh, sorry, cervical hold up the neck. The thoracic, of course, will house our rib cage, which uh, that holds up the rib cage and the lungs. The lumbar is used for support. So a lot of times, you know, people get older, you understand that they have a lot of lumbar pain. Well, things are starting to get old, they're starting to get, worn, um, <clears throat> and that's where they start having a lot more problems. So we count and say the top 24 are movable because after that adolescence, those bottom fuse, so they're not movable anymore. So in between each, of course, we have the intervertebral disc, which is that cushion. So we've all heard of this like um, uh, uh, slip disc or protruding or ruptures. So it's just that soft cushion which includes a nucleus in the middle and that's usually what would be rupturing uh, is that nucleus in the middle. So that's your cushion in between each of these joints, in between each of these bones. The facet joint is where we're going to talk a little bit more in depth about that as well. But that's the interlocking. So where those, um, you can see on the, the diagram there, but where they kind of interlock and intersect with each other. So they kind of attach to each vertebrae and that provides the stability. So um, we can bend and we can move, but it, it creates the stability within each of these bones, within each of these discs. And then, of course, our spinal nerves, those are passing through, so they all come down from the brain, all stemming from the brain, all go down through this little column in the middle. In between each one, they're going to start branching out. And we're going to go into just a tiny bit of why that's important and where we can um, find different problems dealing with the spine in just a couple more slides. So we have the spinous process. So this is looking at the um, one of the um, 
bones, one of those joints, looking at it like from the top down. So we can see that hole in the middle, and that's where all the nerves are going to run through. We have our posterior is that little nub that sticks out the back. So if you run your fingers down somebody's spine, that's what you're feeling. And then we have the anterior. Those two views become very important when we're looking at um, coding for spinal surgeries. So knowing which is the posterior and which is the anterior, because that's going to affect the type of surgical procedures that are performed. So the, that will be important as well to know. And then we have the transverse processes. So you see those sticking out on the sides here. They go out at that 90 degrees, and that's where those muscles will start to attach to the back. So we can see where each of these are important. Now I'm in orthopedic, so of course one of the big things we have coming in all the time is people with back pain. So whether it's from an injury, whether it's from a disease or a medical condition they have, or whether it's just wearing out over time. So we, we quite often see back pains. And you can see why a back pain, somebody who's calling saying I have some neck pain or some back pain, we can see why it's very involved. So we have a patient calling and saying, well, I hurt my wrist. Well, okay, we can figure out pretty easily what's wrong with your wrist. When they say I have back pain, you got a lot of different things you're dealing with there to feed, to narrow it down exactly as to where that problem's coming from, what it might be stemming from, and then what the proper treatment might be. So those appointments are usually a little bit more involved. Now, when it comes to coding, you might hear a lot of doctors say, well, back pain warrants like a 214 or 215. It is very involved, but we always need to look at that overarching criteria of medical necessity. So you are spending a lot of time, but whether it's, um, you know, time figuring out the disease process, if they have something going on, or if it's just stemming from old age or perhaps an injury, they, you know, slipped on some ice or something. So we can see where this all becomes very involved in dealing with the spine. So when we talk about our spinal nerves, so the diagram will show breaking down for us each of these um, each of the joints, each of the bones in the lumbar, um, or in the entire spine, and then the nerves that are related to each. Now just take a look at the, for example, if you can, you know, see the image there. We have the cervical, the seven cervical, and then once you get into the thoracic, you see that we already have that one disc at the top and then T1, and then a disc and then T2, where it's different in the cervical area. So if we can see in the cervical, very top on the top of that is C1 nerve, and then C, then the disc, then C2, then the disc. So we can see it's a little bit different between cervical and thoracic and lumbar. So that very first nerve is between that occipital bone and the atlas. So the very first one starts above everything. So the cervical numbers are for what falls below, and thoracic and lumbar go for what's above. So it can be a little bit different um, depending upon the area that you're looking at. And that's where sometimes it could get confusing when a physician is dealing with a procedure report and telling you the nerve that he injected or the nerve that they're working with because it depends on where that nerve is. And the coding is very dependent on certain factors and we're gonna go into each of those. So then these nerves each divide off into branches. So um, there's like a bundle of them and then they'll come out in between each of these uh, discs. So when we talk about the dermatomes. So looking at this, we all know that uh, people with um, sciatica pain, they might have um, that numbness or tingling down in the foot. Well, if you see S1, the green area, if you can see the diagram, it re relates down to the foot or the calf area, the back of the leg. So each of these spines, and it, it, 
each of these nerves, and it's really interesting, I had some other information as well, but I didn't include it because it was very involved. Um, but if you're interested in this or you're doing a lot of this, go do a little bit more research out there on some of the uh, orthopedic associations or the neurological associations, pain management, and they will have a lot more information like, um, you know, which, which nerve actually bends this finger. You know, it's very detailed as to where it goes. So, um, you know, looking at this, we can see what areas are affected. So if somebody comes in saying, you know, I've got this, this really, you know, it's really bothering my shoulder. And then the doctor says, okay, it's coming from your neck. And you're like, no, but my neck doesn't hurt. It's my shoulder that hurts. Well, it's stemming from a problem in the neck. So everything comes from these spinal nerves. So this is where we get a lot of our other associated signs and symptoms. So when you're looking, uh, providers reviewing a patient, they're going to say, they're going to look for that numbness, tingling, difficulty. People who come in for back pain, they're always wondering, why do you want to know what my bladder is doing? Because your bladder is affected by spinal nerves. So it, you may think that these things don't connect, but everything, of course, is connected by these spinal nerves. They all uh, perform a function within the body. So this is just um, one diagram showing where these spinal nerves are affecting on your body. So it's rather interesting to see, you know, C6 is the upper arm and C7 is down in the fingers, but C8 is around the hand and the wrist. So it's really interesting to see how all of these correlate with each other. So going into some of our terminology, this is also going to include some of the terminology that you're going to see on procedure reports, operative notes, or in the medical record. You may see some of this terminology reflected as well. So when they talk about the vertebrae, that's of course that bone itself, that vertebrae. It's a segment. Um, like they might reference it exactly, C6. You know, they might say the exact bone or the exact segment. This is also where if they have a surgical or an operative report, they're dealing with a corpectomy. So you may see that term, that's dealing with the vertebrae. So the corpectomy is dealing with inside of that bone itself. A vertebral interspace um, is that non-bony compartment, that, that cushion, the stuff in between the bones, the vertebral interspace, that space in between. So that contains that disc. So if we hear discectomy, that's the part that they're dealing with, that inner space. And they will classify it as C6 to C7 because it's the space in between C6 and C7. So we need to speci uh, specify the space that we're dealing with. And this is all very important in a lot of procedure um, notes that we're dealing with. We also have our surgical approaches. Now remember I said your anterior and your posterior, so the, the front portion of the spine and the back portion of that, that spine, uh, spinal column. So that's very important in dealing with some of our surgical procedures. So perhaps if they say an anterior or lateral transthoracic thoracolumbar retroperitoneal, they've done an anterior approach. But if they perhaps say posterior lateral, transpedicular or um, costovertebral, they went in a posterior approach. This is where some of our codes for our surgical procedures, because they specify in the code whether it was an anterior approach or a posterior approach, and they're blocked in certain certain uh, formats for that. These are our anterior approaches. These are our posterior approaches. So these are the types of surgeries we're doing dependent upon how the patient's laid and dependent upon how they went in. So those are some of your key clues to look for in trying to dissect an operative note or looking over a procedure report to see um, what code we're going to go with. We're picking up some of these terms that they're using. 
when they talk about a decompression. Now, a decompression is, of course, those discs are compressing. And so they're going to do a decompression to relieve that pressure in that space or something possibly affecting that nerve because, you know, they're all running through that tube, that tunnel in between the spine. And when they're pressing, and then they branch out. So when they're pressing, when they're compressed, they're pressing on that nerve and we need to release that pressure. So you may hear a discectomy. So they are going to remove a portion of the disc in order to give it more space or um, give the nerve more space in there. A laminectomy, they're going to remove the small bony arch. So we showed that picture that had the two things coming out like this. Well, then there's the arch in there on that diagram. So the bony arch, they're going to remove some of the lamina that they're going to do a laminectomy. Uh, 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 foraminectomy. So they're going to remove the bone tissue um, to open up that forma for the nerves. So the forma is that space in between and they're going to remove some of that tissue in there to make the space a little bit bigger. And then um, osteophyte. You may have an osteophyte. Well, that's a bone spur. So a little piece of calcification, a little bit of bone, an osteophyte has formed. And that could press on the nerve, perhaps, or um, uh, press on that space in between there. And it causes discomfort and pain. So we need to get rid of that as well. So when we look at some of these surgical procedures for decompression, we need to look at the inner spaces and the levels. So we need to make sure we are, you know, they're going to say C5, C6 or, you know, L1, L2. So we need to make sure that we're looking at um, where this is being performed. And these are diagnosis based. So remember, these are um, something that's causing pressure in there. So there's going to be certain diagnoses that are mentioned in CPT that are going to draw us to whatever this, the code is for. So a lot of these are based on the diagnosis and that's somehow, that's sometimes how you narrow down what procedure it is you're going to be doing. And then the, the type and the location of the decompression. So that, that disectomy, the laminectomy, what type are they doing? And what nerve root, which of these nerves was decompressed. So they may mention that in the operative note as well. We're looking for what nerve did they decompress. And you know, one of our terms we used was a laminectomy, one of the types of procedures. Now a fusion, so we already have bones that are already fused after adolescence, and then the rest are all free so that we can move and twist and bend and stand and do all the things that the spine is able, you know, supposed to be able to do. So the spinal fusion, you're going to correct a problem with that bone and restore the stability of those bones. So that's why they do a fusion. And you have limited motion, either possibly from arthritis, um, starting to get old age, arthritis, um, degenerative disc disease, or some kind of deformity is why you're going to do a spinal diffusion, or a spinal fusion, not diffusion, a fusion. And they're going to look at the inner bodies. So you may see um, a picture if you were to just Google spinal fusion, you're going to see a plate that's in between um, these two levels. So like, um, you know, L1, L2, they'll put a plate in there that, or a rod perhaps, something to, to um, provide stability within those two. It may limit the motion a little bit of a patient. They may not even notice it really, but uh, depending upon where it is, um, but it's gonna create, uh, so that you don't have, uh, to have a decompression done. You don't have the discs um, pressing on each other and causing more pain. So we do the fusion to um, provide that stability. So we of course have to look at the levels that they're doing the fusion of and count them properly. And you may hear them talk about an arthrodesis. 
uh, with these types of procedures of fusion. So a fusion, you're going to use an instrument typically, such as like a screw or a rod, a plate. Um, they may use all, it depends on um, the, it depends on the surgical, the, the procedure depends on the doctor as well. Some are more comfortable with certain procedures than maybe new advancements. Um, and it depends upon the um, severity of the problem. And of course, if, if there's any other issues that are being involved, as with everything, it's kind of based upon medical necessity. What's actually necessary for that patient? What type of fusion do they need? So you have to know which levels if they were segmented, the approach that they used, and sometimes it goes by the name of that equipment or that the type of that uh, instrument or equipment that they're using in place of that fusion. So they may do wires. They may say that spinous process, that little um, nub, they're gonna wire them. Um, they may uh, use uh, something from the pelvis in order to support uh, a spinal fusion. Also, with fusions, just about every fusion is used as a graft. So they need some type of graft material because our, the reason they use a graft material is to stimulate that bone healing. So they've screwed something in there. They've placed a rod in there. They've done something. Now we need that bone to heal and accept that instrument that they've used. So we have an allograft or we have an autograft. Now remember auto means self. So it's something taken from you. So the patient, uh, they used to always do from the pelvis. So they used to take a piece of the pelvic bone and put it in in the, the lumbar spine or the somewhere in the spine. So it used to always be autographs, but now they can do allographs. They can do um, matrices of materials. They could use cadaver bones. So there's different types of allographs that are used, and that's where some of your coding comes in. Some surgical procedures in CPT will use, will already include grafting. So we need to make sure that, that we're watching the verbiage there and see if grafting's already included. But otherwise, you're going to look for an allograft or an autograft, um, different uh, codes for dependent upon what was used. And then you may actually use a bone marrow as well. So they may do a bone marrow aspiration and re-inject that um, as well for a type of graft. So grafting, we need to look at the terms that they use for grafting. What type of graft did they use? Where did they get it from? Um, was it an aspiration or was it an actual you know, piece of bone? So that's very important in looking through some of the procedure codes to determine what needs to be billed to the insurance carrier for this uh, surgery that they provided. Of course, we have um, osteotomies. Um, that's a, you want to correct a deformity. So um, we've heard of uh, um, lordosis and kyphosis. So lordosis, you have like a sway back and kyphosis, you have the hunchback. So that's the curvature of the spine is affecting um, posture. It's affecting a lot of different things actually because the it limits the ability of the spine to do what it's supposed to be doing. If you have lordosis or kyphosis, it could be causing pressure on some of those nerves because of the way that the spine is curved. It, you don't have as much space in between them now. So um, they may need to correct some of those deformities and they might use an osteotomy. And then we need to look at what segments did they do. A lot of times when they go in, they do like a, a wedge approach. So if it's um, kind of, you know, you're looking like this, they'll take out a little bit of a wedge and it will kind of hoping to straighten out that spine if they just wedge a little piece of the bone out. So what segment did they do this at? They could possibly use a biomechanical device 
as well. So uh, uh, biomechanics um, goes per level. So maybe on that same level, that C7, I just pick one out of the blue, on that C7, they may do something on anterior and posterior sides to perform, to make that stable. But that's only one. They may have two devices on there, but it's only one level. So um, biomechanics uh, looks at the level. And then if they had, so if they had two on one level, that's only one. But if they had C7 and L2, well, that's two different levels, two different devices. So that would be, you're looking at a units of two for that biomechanical device. So there's um, ankylosing spondylitis, which is, uh, it's a, and it's an inflammatory uh, condition that, um, causes some of these, the spinal vertebrae to fuse together on their own through inflammation. So um, that fusing, of course, you can imagine that the spine is not flexible anymore. If, the, if those have fused together, it's gonna limit movement, range of motion, bending, standing. It's gonna have a lot of different results to it. So you could have a hunched forward posture possibly. Um, so that's a deformity that they're gonna wanna correct with biomechanics. They're gonna wanna put spaces in between some of those so that they don't have, so that they can't fuse together. You don't want those bones to fuse together. Another thing we look at in the spine is a pathological fracture. So we know definitely in elderly, a lot of people may have a, um, a stress fracture. Uh, they may not have even done anything. They may have possibly um, not even a slip and fall necessarily in a bathtub or something, but sometimes um, bending over to tie their shoes. Um, elderly people who start to bones start to deteriorate and wear can suffer stress fractures for just some minor uh, minor issues you may think of everyday thing that how could that cause a stress fracture so to fix some of these uh, fractures a pathological or stress fracture they may do a percutaneous procedure so there's another term that we're looking for an operative note we're looking for one our diagnosis of a pathological fracture but as well there would do a percutaneous procedure and then usually they're injecting something like a cement in there in order to fix that bone in order to help it so injections i'm going to spend a little bit of time on these injections um, i'm not going to go into exactly uh, spinal codes so spinal coding for surgeries you're going to um, determine your diagnosis it's going to be determined by the approach that you're using and you know what kind of problem it's for what are you doing are you decompressing are you doing a fusion so it depends on the reason for the procedure and then you're going to look in either the 20,000 for muscular skeletal or in the 60,000 section for neurology so lumbar spinal um, surgeries or I don't mean just lumbar I'm sorry spinal surgeries come either an orthopedic provider uh, or possibly a neurologist. You may have a team working on it. You may have a team approach. You may have an orthopedic as well as a neurologist because you're affecting the nerves as well as the bones. So they may need two specialists depending upon the problem. Then of course you have your team approach. Now CPT includes all of the guidelines for the type of approach you'll notice some of the terms will say um, for the specific procedure for something other than a, a specific diagnosis, other than a lesion. So that's gonna narrow down some of the possibilities you have with your spinal coding. Spinal coding is greatly involved and we can easily do uh, 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 operative notes and dissecting operative notes uh, with a you know student Q and A, um, 
something a little bit more in depth. So I just wanted to bring to attention, we've had a lot of questions coming in about the injections. So I wanted to do some of the spine background in order to talk about the injections. So that's kind of the where this all came from. Um, spinal level coding and spinal coding for surgeries is a lot more in depth. Um, Fortunately, we don't do that many of them. Um, we send them a lot to a spine surgeon, either in Baltimore or DC, um, because we have a team that works together and one of our physicians just retired. So uh, they don't all, no longer have the two people on that team that work together doing our lumbar surgeries. So a lot of them now will send out to another facility. Um, but uh, injections is something a lot of people see, whether you're in pain management or anesthesia, orthopedics or neurology. So there's a lot of different fields that deal with these spinal injections. So spinal injections can be used for a diagnostic or a therapeutic approach. So you're looking to control that pain that a patient has. Now, typically they start with a diagnostic injection because we need to determine where it's coming from. So just like uh, we look at the dermatomes of where the levels affect different body parts, so they're going to assess where some of the associated um, signs are, some other problems that they're having to try and narrow down where some of these problems are. So they'll start with a diagnostic approach and and then from there, once they know where the problem is, then they can give therapeutic injections after that that are going to help relieve the pain. Um, a lot of times, not everybody is a candidate for lumbar surgery. So um, some people may just have to monitor and control that pain through pain management. So that's where they may need a series of injections. So we have epidural injections. Of course, we've all heard of those in our range of codes. The intralaminar epidural is where we're looking specifically at the lamina. We're looking at specific areas in some of these injections. So we have it without catheter and then with catheter. Um, so, and then there's different codes for, uh, um, catheters that are left in, uh, uh, like a prosthesis almost, you know, catheter that's left in there. So these are actually for pain management. These series of codes, the 62320 through 62323 and 62324 through, through 62327, those are specifically for um, pain management. These are not anesthesia codes. So sometimes people may be taking a test or new to the field or just reviewing some information. They may think that because you're doing an epidural that it's anesthesia. So these series of codes here, and, and I have them marked in my CPT book, and every year I retranscribe the information from one CPT book into the new one. So I mark these every year. I highlight them and say these are not anesthesia codes. So I don't want to forget one time and get mixed up in a, a question or um, if I'm taking an exam because I'm keep continuing to take new exams. So um, I don't want to get messed up and, and forget, you know, stressed, you have two and a half minutes to answer that question. I don't want to choose the wrong code by accident. So I, I make a notation in my CPT manual that these are for pain management, not anesthesia. And then we have the transforaminal. So the, dealing with that um, foramen. So there's different areas in that spine. So that's why we go over some of the anatomy. Uh, the CPT and the HICPIC books do include anatomical pictures, so you might want to make notations on some of those perhaps if that helps, um, dealing with um, which type of injection these may be, um, diagnostic or therapeutic. There are all sorts of injections that are done, but when we're dealing with the spine, we can narrow down some of those uh, injections. Probably one of the more common injections that's performed is a medial branch block or a facet joint injection. These are actually the same code. So they may reference a medial branch block was performed, but that is a facet 
joint injection. So we have our series of codes 64490 to 64495. These are dealing with the region. So we have um, cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral. So, and then each additional level. So we have add on codes for additional levels as well. So when we're looking at this, it's so important. And this is where a lot of times it gets mixed up. I'll go into the reason why it gets mixed up too. You're looking at the number of facet joints that were injected, not the nerves. Remember, the nerves bundle out and come in between each um, disc, each in between each bone there. So but there's more than one too. So as they branch out, we know we got two, one on the left, one on the right, as well as there's multiple in there. There's actually more nerves than that. So that's a, a branch block. We're doing a block of those nerves to alleviate pain. So the labeling should be the facet joint, L1 to L2. We don't deal with the L2 nerve, we're dealing with the joint L1 to L2. And that terminology is very, very important. Now, the reason some of this is a problem for a lot of providers and encoders, especially if you're new to coding, these codes changed back in 2012. So they used to be different. They used to be able to say that L2, it was easy. Well, because the codes changed, this is how we do it now. If you have a provider who's been around 10 to 15 years, they're still doing it the old way. So it's been changed for seven, eight years now. However, we still have people, we know how they get set in their ways. That's the way they learned it. That's the way they do it. They got too many other things to worry about. So once they learn it once, they're, you know, they're, they're not going to do it again. So this is where some of this terminology comes in and it may require physician queries. Clarification of what was actually done, what was actually performed with addendums to that procedure report. You wanna make sure that if that is exactly what was done, that it's adjusted as such in the medical record to support our medical necessity and in case of audits and anything you know needs to reflect the correct information. You're sending that to another doctor's office. They moved and now they're going to a different pain management doctor. We need that information in there correctly. So they may say, I performed a medial branch block at the L3, L4, L5 nerves. Well, we can't go by the nerves. L3, L4, and L5, they innerviate. They stem from L4, L5, and L5, S1, facet joints. So you can say L3, L4, L5, I did three nerves, and we don't know if they did right or left. That's important as well. Um, but we're only going to report two codes because we have them coming out of L4, L5, and L5S1, that's the facet joint. These are facet joint codes. So it gets very difficult. This, this takes a lot of dissection, a lot of patience, and you know a lot of highlighting, circling, underlining, a lot of um, information. So we had a question come in. When coding for medial branch block facet injections, when a provider, provider uses the verbiage such as, I injected a lateral mass instead of saying a joint. So if we could explain the coding of the levels of the nerves that are involved, um, and it's correct, you do L3 to L4, L4 to L5. That's what you're looking at is your joints. In this situation, if, I, if all I had was an operative report that said lateral masses, we really don't know what they were injecting. We don't know. So it's going to require a physician query. You need to go right back to the physician and ask them because we don't use that terminology. So we need to know exactly what service was performed so that we're coding accurately. So the injection should be loaded per, uh, per level, not that nerve. 
we need to make sure that that level is indicated in the procedure note or the operative note, not the nerve. They can say the nerve, but we need to make sure that level is there as well because that's important. A lateral mass. Well, it's not a facet joint. An medial branch block is done at that outside joint space near the nerve. Do you mean a mass of nerves? You know, you're kind of, what do you mean? Does the person have a actual mass, a cyst, a tumor, or something? Is there some kind of mass that's blocking the area? It's very important to know the distinction. Did we do a facet joint injection? Did you do a medial branch block? Did we do some other kind of injection? So we need to go back and ask if they have, if they use a strange verbiage, we need them to clarify specifically for these medial branch blocks or facet joint injections, the level that they're dealing with, the sides, the laterality, and um, dealing exactly with the terms that we need to use in order to code properly. They'd like to be paid for these procedures, I'm sure. So we need to get the payment proper for what was actually performed. So when you're looking at the facet joint injection guidelines, there's it. this took a lot of research. Um, it's actually stemmed from a student had a question uh, dealing with pain management, and I've learned a lot in the, in the time of, of helping. So the American Academy of Pain Medicine, the AAPM, states in their guidelines for facet joint injections, in order to report these procedures appropriately, physicians must clearly document the vertebral region level and the facet joint in involved and if it was unilateral or bilateral. So it's very important documentation. Now, what if you're dealing with a neurologist? What if you're dealing with an orthopedic? What if you're dealing with somebody else who's providing these that doesn't belong to the Pain Medicine Association? Well, this is where some clarification of the guidelines that we could use to say, this is the information that's needed. This is what this society has put out here. Since nobody else has, we need to clarify this information, please. CMS has guidelines and LCDs. Um, it's a little vague, so you kind of need to read between the lines of CMS. Um, the required documents that are needed to support the surgery include a description of the techniques employed, the nerves injected, and sites of injection. So it says our nerves and the site. Where did that site come from? L2, L3, L3, L4, L5, S1. What site was that at? So it doesn't specifically state you have to give us the level, but they say the site needs to be um, documented. They're actually in 2008 came out an OIG report because uh, I've read the whole IG, the whole OIG report. It's pretty interesting. Um, the amount of increases in procedures and in dollars paid that stemmed and created this OIG report and investigation that created that investigation to look into it is astronomical. I mean, it's just it very fascinating actually to see how in a matter of years it can go from i'm going to use an example uh, one million in claims to one billion in claims so i mean are that many people hurt or kind of are we miscoding and that's where our oig reports come from and investigations so the oig report in 2008 says the majority of records for these services were missing a description of the procedure that was billed. Now, granted, this is 2008. This is before the change in the codes, but it's still it's still very important information. So others had a procedure note, but were missing details of that procedure, such as which levels and sides of the back were injected. So they're specifically stating in the OIG report that the missing information should include the procedure details, such as what levels and your laterality. 
So very important information. So between all these three, we can see that when you're dealing with a facet joint injection, you need to have that information. I know doctors like to have it spelled out exactly word for word, but possibly showing documentation from three different sources, we can say, this is what they're looking for. So if we wanna be paid, we wanna be paid properly and stay compliant and prove medical necessity, we should just as a standard include this information. Another question that I had when coding the cervical medial branch radiofrequency neurotomy injections, when a provider states an articular pillar instead of a joint. So they're stating an area more specific than just a nerve, but it doesn't say specifically joints. So they had a problem determining the correct levels of their spine coding. So the joint, a little definition then, is the joint between the superior articular process of one vertebrae and the inferior articular process of the vertebrae directly above it. So that's the joint, the facet joints, are situated between the pedicle and the lamina of the same vertebrae and form the articular pillar. So the facet joint forms the articular pillar. So he's stating articular pillar, it's the same thing as your facet joint. So that prov provides that stability. That's the same thing that the facet joint does. So again, uh, just a description with um, a picture there. So we have the spinous process and the transverse process, of course, and the little things that stick out. But then that red dot is that articular pillar. That's that facet joint that we're looking at. So the facet joints are situated between those and form that articular pillar. So you think of a pillar in front of a house or a building, it's creating that holding up, it's supporting it. So those are all lining up to support the spinal column. So what is a radiofrequency neurotomy? That is an injection in which they heat a lesion, uh, a, sorry, a heat lesion is created on the nerve. So the nerve is sending the signals to the brain, right? Saying, uh, we got a problem here, there's some kind of situation. So if they heat that up and create a lesion on there, they're hoping to interrupt that signal that's going to the brain. So that's what a radiofrequency neurotomy injection is. While you can still have normal sensation, you can still have muscle strength, you can still do all the same things you normally do, they're trying to interrupt that signal that's saying we're in pain. So those are specific CPT codes for a radiofrequency neurotomy. Again, it's per joint, not per nerve. And you don't use it for a pulsed radiofrequency or any kind of chemical use or a low-grade energy. Those are different CPT codes. So if you're doing a medial branch um, radiofrequency neurotomy injection, this is what you're doing. Another question we had was looking specifically at a uh, facet joint injection. So they're talking about a first level, C4. So they gave a, a description out of the procedure note. So the patient's identified by name and placed in the prone position on the fluoroscopy table. They're, they were prepped and draped, tissues were anesthetized, um, a 22 gauge, three half inch spinal needle, just sounds horrible if you think about it, was advanced on the mid portion of the bilateral C4 lateral masses. This person's using masses as their term. So needle placement was confirmed with fluoroscopy, which is a very important step. It's required for facet joint injections is to have fluoroscopy. It needs to be guided. Um, then a CC, one cc of a solution with lidocaine and kenalog was injected into each lateral mass. So their question was, I thought to code the facet injections that the joint had to be injection. So your medial um, branch block is outside of that joint space near the nerve. Um, is the lateral mass is considered part of this? So should the description be more clear, like at C3, C4 or C4, C5? which yes, that is the answer. Yes, it needs to be more clear. However, 
So a facet block is an injection of an anesthetic and a steroid into the joint in the spine. A medial branch block is similar, but that same medication is placed outside of the joint space near the nerve that supplies that joint. Um, so nowhere in there did we hear masses. So it's in the joint or the joint space near the nerves. There's nothing about a mass. Facet blocks and medial branch blocks are used with patients who have a pain primarily in the back uh, due to arthritic changes or low back pain. So if perhaps looking at that procedure note, the description for a diagnosis was something else, we could maybe rule out a, uh, a facet joint injection or a branch block um, that anesthetic is used to temporarily block those nerves from sending those signals to the pain, uh, to the brain. And once they do that, once they say, you know what, um, after they have these injections performed, the patient waits a little bit, they have them perform certain, um, like bending or, you know, certain functions to see if that helped relieve their pain. They only do a couple at a time. They're only allowed per CMS guidelines to do three at a time. Uh, levels to determine where that pain is. So in the diagnostic portion, we need to know where it is we have to go. If that helped alleviate the pain, then they know next time you come back in, we can provide therapeutic injections in that area. But if it didn't help, then the next time they come back, they're going to do three different ones and see if that relieves the pain. So they'll do another diagnostic. And there is a limitation to how many that can be performed per CMS. So it's all on the LCDs for your area. So if we're looking again at, at the description that they put out there, they did a spinal needle. So I can only assume it's a spinal um, injection. But they said bilateral C4. Remember, we don't deal with the nerve. We do know it's bilateral, so we did right and left, but we don't deal specifically with the nerve. We need that level. We need the, the um, facet joint level description of a lateral mass. Well, we don't know what that mass is. And they did it with fluoroscopy, so that is a requirement for a facet joint injection. So it's possible. But he didn't say facet joint. They didn't say injection of the facet joint or the um, spinal uh, joint in the spine. They didn't say branch block. They didn't say, uh, you know, block of the nerves. It's not in that epidural space because he's talking about a mass. Where is this mass exactly? They didn't even, the only term we have is spinal needle. I would, can only, I'm not a doctor, but I can only assume you use a spinal needle on the spine. So I don't see you injecting another body part with a spinal needle. Um, that we didn't do a catheter placement, so it's not one of the epidurals. Um, it's what other kind of injections do we have? We've got all sorts of injections in the 20,000 section of CPT. We've got small joint. Well, it's not a small joint or a bursa, a large joint or medium joint or bursa. He didn't say that. The provider didn't say a tendon sheath or a ligament. So we, based off of this information, don't know what kind of injection this is. I personally may be inclined to go with a trigger point injection and a fluoroscopic code, but really it requires a physician query. So there's no real information included in this procedure. So going back to look at that OIG report, sure we got a description, but it didn't tell us anything. It didn't tell us the procedure used. It didn't tell us the actual area other than bilateral C4. That's all that we know. So we assume it's the spine because it's C4, but we don't know what part. We don't know where exactly, what exact procedure was performed. It's very important information. So I know it's a lot of information. It is very important. Um, I've probably gone over spine stuff, um, webinars and stuff multiple times. Uh, information I've pulled up, I've printed off and I've kept in a folder because it is very difficult. Spine coding, um, is the levels are difficult to come up with um, to know exactly which type of injection is being done, uh, which exact part of the spine, the form, the you know the foreman, the inner space, that what what exactly that little bone? It's probably what that big. Which part of it did we do? 
So it's very, it can be very difficult and it can be confusing. So it takes a little while, even when a question comes in uh, from a student, I still pull out that information and make sure that it is correct. Make sure that um, we've looked at every type of, you know, term that is included in that procedure note. I will gladly take any questions that hopefully I could answer if anybody has any. So. See, so if there are any further questions, you can post something on the CCO website, um, a topic request. If you belong to a CCO student or a member, you can put it in the forum if you have a question similar to this, or just uh, review the information again and see what um, terms you can pull out and what type of approach might have been used and help narrow down some of the selections that we have. So I hope everybody has a wonderful rest of the week and a happy holiday.